the legislative attitude towards statelessness, I think, is really clear when you look at the definition of foreign national in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, so section 2 sub 1 of you know, the main immigration law, uh, which has, it's, there's a definition section of all the different terms that play out through the act, and it says that a foreign national, quote unquote, means, and I'm reading here, a person who is not a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, and includes a stateless person. Which I have, I have every now and then I come across, and I have to keep reading it to make sure I'm really understanding it. So it's saying that a foreign national, so a national of a foreign state, is someone who has no state. A stateless person is a foreign national. That, to me, uh, sort of demonstrates uh, how the rest of the act deals with statelessness. It's a, it's a state of denial. In Canada, the main way to resolve statelessness status for someone, for someone who's not born here and finds themselves in Canada, uh, is to start with making a refugee claim uh, to the Immigration and Refugee Board, the Refugee Protection Division. As you know, uh, IRPA, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, incorporates the 1951 Convention definition of a refugee, which means that a stateless person who comes to Canada seeking status here, seeking protection, can make a refugee claim, and they can do that on the basis of persecution they fear uh, elsewhere, their country of former habitual residence. But if they're coming to Canada and they didn't face persecution per se, but they simply had no state, they had, they had no place to call home, no ability to remain anywhere, and they make a refugee claim, they'll be denied. Because they need to establish not only that they can't go back somewhere, they need to establish that they'll be persecuted in this place where they can't go back to. Um, that said, there are complications in uh, refugee claims by stateless persons, particularly because, as we all know, stateless people often go from place to place, so they often don't just live in one place, they live in two or three places over the course of their lives before they come to Canada. Um, so there was a question about what you need to do to demonstrate that you are a refugee if you've had more than one uh, place of former habitual residence. It's a court of appeal decision called Thavet, T-H-A-V-E-T, which sets out uh, the approach that refugee decision makers need to take in these cases. What a stateless person needs to establish is that they face persecution in at least one of their countries of former habitual residence but only one, uh, and that they can't go back to any other country of former habitual residence. And it's not can't, that they're unwilling to go back to any other country of former habitual residence. This is a bit of a complicated, largely undefined area of law right now, because what that unwillingness needs to mean, does it just mean I don't want to go? Does it mean unwillingness as in the refugee definition, unwillingness because I'll be persecuted there? That it says no. What does unwillingness actually mean? It's, it's sort of a wide open question. The other way uh, to seek protection for a stateless person is to bring a PRA application, a pre-removal risk assessment application, which is a paper-based application based on the same, uh, you know, the Refugee Convention, the Convention Against Torture. Um, in principle, the same approach that that should apply. Uh, so to get accepted get protection under the fraud, you should be able to only show that persecution in one of your countries of former habitual residence. The manual, um, and I think I referred to this in the paper, the manual for fraud decision makers misstates the law. So the manual says you need to show you'll be persecuted in every country of former habitual residence. So if there are people from CIC here, um, this is something that uh, UNHCR and CCR and I have been pointing out for a very long time. The manual was just updated, but this has not changed. Okay, I'm going to fly through now. Um, humanitarian compassion grounds is the third way, I would say, of a stateless person in Canada to get status. Of course, it doesn't give you citizenship, but it gives you permanent residence under Section 25. And once you're a permanent resident, of course, you have many of the rights that a citizen citizen has, and after a few years, you can then apply uh, to become a citizen. <laughs> Statelessness uh, is not identified in the manual for humanitarian compassionate decision makers as a factor that needs to be considered 
Again, this is something that I think CIC is an easy thing to do. It would be very helpful uh, to put decision makers on notice that statelessness, the fact that someone, if you don't accept them, is going to remain stateless <coughs> in Canada for the rest of their lives, is a clearly relevant factor that needs to be taken into account uh, by decision makers. So if, uh, if CIC is here, this too, just one, one more bullet item would be very helpful. That said, we have raised these issues uh, in the federal court. There are, there's a case called Diaby from uh, 2014, I think it was my client, um, where the court found that it was uh, really a reviewable error to fail to, to consider the impact of refusing an application by a stateless person, where that refusal means this person is going to be stuck in Canada with no status, potentially forever, because the person was not removed. I will just point to the last two issues that I wanted to, uh, to talk about. I practiced this like three times, and it was under 20 minutes every time. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> detention and removal. Uh, these, these are big areas. Statelessness, particularly de facto statelessness, often causes people to be detained in Canada for very, very long periods of time. Not just months, but years. The, you know, we, we can get into really complicated, convoluted discussions about whether somebody who we know was born, they say they were born in a country that should recognize their nationality, but the country is simply not responding to Canada's requests. Is that person stateless? At what point? How long do you have to keep asking before we say, yeah, they're stateless? I would say a couple of asks and they say no or they don't respond, we should treat them as de facto stateless. Uh, and that means they should be getting out of detention. Instead, these people remain in detention while Canada Border Services Agency makes requests to embassies and consulates and national capitals. I have a client, or my, not my, I don't, my, my office has a client who was in detention for a decade for no reason other than his status and citizenship could not be ascertained. His identity couldn't be ascertained. There were mental health issues. And he was simply stuck. And he had monthly reviews, month after month after month. Immigration division members said, you know, there are efforts being made to determine where he's from uh, until we're satisfied we can't release him. So again, this is an area. If there are researchers here, I would love to see research on this area. And finally, uh, very last point, is with respect to removal right now, uh, the provisions, the regulations that apply to determining where to remove someone who uh, has not been able to get status in Canada, if they are stateless and they have no nationality, there's a wide range of places to which they can be removed under the regulations. So not only can CBSA remove them to a country of former habitual residence, but maybe they at least have some connection they can be removed to any country. And that, that's specifically what it says in the regulations. They can be removed to any country to which CPSA is able to, to put them in. That's a problem. That's a problem particularly for stateless people who may find themselves uh, perpetually balanced from state to state to state with no access uh, to any resolution of this breach of their fundamental rights. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs>
which prescribes minimum treatment provisions for refugees. Um, and the basic premise of, of my report was that over the years, Canada has given three reasons for not acceding to the 1954 Convention. The first one is that uh, there's a belief that Canada's legal framework already is largely compatible and safeguards the rights of stateless persons in Canada. Uh, the second is that the 1951 Refugee Convention uh, duplicates the 1954 Stateless Convention. And the third reason is that acceding to the 54 Convention would be a pull factor for stateless persons and encourage them to renounce citizenship in order to remain in Canada. Now, I didn't focus in my report on the last two, so it's mostly about the first factor, uh, which is that the belief that Canada's legal framework provides all the necessary safeguards for the situation of stateless persons. Um, and in particular, uh, my report focused on the federal legislation, regulations, and policies, and the legislation, regulation, and policies relating to the standard of rights in the 54 Convention. Uh, the provinces were British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec largest provinces and to review all the legislation in every province which just had no management. Um, <clears throat> and then furthermore, uh, after <coughs> examining the legislation uh, of the federal government and provinces, uh, there was some analysis of whether or not Canada's other international human rights obligations could uh, create an obligation on Canada to meet or exceed the standard uh, for stateless persons if there was any sort of incompatibility. All right. So I'll just quickly highlight some of the key incompatibilities uh, that I found with respect to Canada's legal framework and the 54 Convention. Uh, one of the main one is, is Article 1, which provides the definition of stateless persons. Uh, it's the cornerstone of the, of the 1954 Convention, and as you already mentioned, it defines stateless persons as a person who is not considered a national of any state under the operation of its law. <coughs> now, and Andrew also mentioned that Canadian law doesn't explicitly provide either a definition of stateless persons or any sort of consideration for either the Immigration or Refugee Protection Act, uh, you know, Citizenship Act, or various regulations. Um, now, although there is no sort of explicit recognition of this definition, I think we could at least say that uh, since the 54 Convention definition has been considered of a customary nature under international law, that through the doctrine of adoption, that at least we can appreciate that Canada probably has the same understanding of that definition in the convention, uh, because customary international law forms part of the Canadian common law, unless there's an express uh, legislative provision to the contrary. So on examining the compatibility with the Canadian legal framework, with the definition in the 54 convention, on, on a positive note, at least say that Canada's understanding of who might be stateless in the common law is that under international law. But the problem is, is that by not having any sort of explicit legislative uh, provision that recognizes stateless persons in Canada, uh, providing them with any sort of status, uh, ends up uh, sort of creates a black hole for stateless persons. There's no sort of status that takes into consideration their unique circumstances. And this is problematic because under international law, statelessness is a juridically relevant fact. Um, the recognition of statelessness itself is important to ensure access to a whole range of human rights. So, 
where statelessness is mentioned, Andrew uh, talked about this briefly, that stateless persons are instead grouped with all other foreign nationals uh, under the IRPA. And foreign nationals defined, again, as a person who is not a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident and includes a stateless person. So by being simply viewed as any other foreign national, uh, statelessness itself ends up not being provided any sort of unique status or access to rights under Canadian law. And this is key in incompatibility. Now, even though statelessness is being grouped as any sort of other foreign national, there's actually a small benefit to that under the 54 Convention. And that's because a lot of the, the rights under, under the Convention require that stateless persons be treated at least given the same treatment as any other foreign national. So by putting them in the definition and conducting an analysis of whether or not Canadian law is compatible or not, uh, in some cases the rights uh, were being met because stateless persons were being treated by definition under the law as, as any other foreign national. But by grouping stateless persons with any other immigrant, uh, it kind of masks and obscures uh, the, their unique circumstances, which would be ben benefited by some sort of unique status under Canadian law. Um, and considering the juridical importance of stateless person status uh, to have access to human rights, um, some states have implemented a stateless determination procedure uh, and even states that aren't part of the 1954 Convention. Uh, such determinations are crucial in the context of like removal proceedings, uh, passport and identity documents, accessing social services, and individuals seeking the application of the 1961 Convention on Statelessness. And in addition, having some sort of determination procedure would be beneficial to ensure that international human rights law obligations on uh, are being met. So you can see that even though there's no other international human rights obligation that would impose upon Canada to establish a determination procedure, uh, specifically, uh, one could argue that, uh, like in the situations where Andrew mentioned a person living in limbo for 10 years in detention awaiting removal, that this legal limbo violates a stateless person's right to an effective remedy, uh, the right to liberty and security of the person, the right not to be subjected to cruel and un inhuman and degrading treatment under the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and that's a treaty to which Canada is a party. And uh, without some sort of determination of state status in Canada, it's kind of difficult to foresee how Canada can meet its international human rights obligation, uh, obligations to stateless persons uh, without identifying uh, and protecting stateless persons. So that's the key incompatibility with respect to Article 1 and the definition of stateless persons. Now I'll just mention a couple of other of uh, the minimum standard of treatment clauses and the 54 Convention, and how it relates to stateless persons. So I'll talk about public education, which is Article 22, uh, public relief, and Article 23, and Social Security, Article 24, and quickly, identity papers and travel documents under Article 24 and 28. So Article 22 of the 54 Convention, uh, require states to provide public elementary education to stateless persons to the same extent as that provided nationals. And in Canada, that means that that's free public elementary education. Article 22 also requires states to provide stateless persons uh, with education beyond elementary education to a level at least as favorable as aliens generally. Um, and 
there's no restriction whether or not uh, a stateless person is in Canada, either uh, lawfully or unlawfully. So even if, even if the, a stateless person is uh, in Canada without status, undocumented, there's still an obligation to meet that, that requirement. <clears throat> Under the Immigration Protection Immigration Refugee Protection Act, uh, Section 372, I believe it is, uh, allows minor children to attend elementary and secondary school without a valid study permit. Uh, if their accompanying parent has a work or study permit, they are a permanent resident, they are a refugee claimant, or they are in Canada without the status. Um, however, the Immigration Refugee Protection Act does not say anything of minor children to being exempt from foreign fees. Um, so that is positive in that there's no kind of you know, permit requirements. Uh, however, it's a bit problematic that there's no exemption for foreign fees and the provincial legislation with respect to public education is very inconsistent. So for example, in Ontario, which I guess you could say is the higher watermark, the Education Act permits all children less than 18 years to attend elementary and secondary school, even without lawful status. Um, and further policy guidance exempts students without status from paying fees. Although there are some reports that this is not always applied uh, consistently. Uh, in, in BC and Alberta, however, there's a residency, there's a lawful admission and or a temporary resident status requirement in order for foreign nationals to be enrolled, uh, which leaves some foreign nationals, including stateless children, without access to free elementary uh, education, just like Canadian nationals. So that's an inconsistency. And until recently, Quebec was in a similar situation as BC and Alberta, but I since the report, I've heard that they're taking more of an Ontario approach, which is positive. Um, oh, and, and so even, even though this, there's this incompatibility there with the 54 Convention in public education in Canada, uh, I would note that under Article 28 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Canada has uh, a standard to meet which requires that all children, that states are to make primary education compulsory and free to all, and in accordance with Article 2 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child without discrimination on the basis of national, ethnic, social origin, birth, or other status. So even though there's that incompatibility with the 54 Convention, uh, Canada's other international rights obligations apply, and those uh, inconsistencies should be uh, moving to Article 23, uh, which involves issues of uh, welfare and disability benefits. Um, right. There's uh, been an inconsistency as well across the provinces, and I'll just list a couple of the examples. So uh, this with respect to welfare and disability benefits, uh, depending on the province in which you live, you may or may not have access to the standard of treatment in the 54 Convention. So, in Alberta, stateless or nationals with a temporary resident permit would be eligible for welfare and disability, but not persons with an unenforceable removal order and those who have submitted a humanitarian and compassionate grounds application. In BC, uh, stateless foreign nationals with a temporary resident permit and per persons subject to an unenforceable removal order are eligible. In Ontario, stateless foreign nationals who submitted an agency application, persons subject to an unenforceable removal order are eligible, but persons with a temporary resident permit are not. In Quebec, persons who submitted Humanitarian and compassionate applications are eligible, but persons subject to an unenforceable removal order or with a temporary residence permit are not eligible. So depending on the province, you can, may or may not have access. 
and how these inconsistencies uh, Canadian legal framework is incompatible with those. So, for the sake of time, I'll move on to Social Security under Article 24 of the 54 Convention. Uh, Article 24 requires that state parties provide stateless persons who are lawfully staying in their territory with the same treatment as nationals with respect to Social Security. This includes old age pension and employment insurance, which I'll talk about now. Actually, Social Security includes many other rights, and, and it talks about labor legislation and talks about occupational health and safety and Canada is largely compatible with those aspects of Article 24. But I'll just quickly highlight that uh, recently Canada implemented an employment insurance scheme uh, for self-employed individuals uh, and this uh, unfortunately is only uh, available for citizens and permanent residents. So that is something where stateless foreign nationals would not be able to participate in, which is uh, an incompatibility. In addition, on the issue of old age security, uh, on its face, federal legislation is compatible with Article 24, but the policies that provide guidance to individuals to apply for OAS um, has been reported to create obstacles for uh, immigrant populations. So in order to apply for OAS, immigrant populations have to fulfill particular documentation requirements such as proof of date, uh, proof of birthday, and certified copies of Canadian immigration documents such as record of landing and old immigration passport stamps. Um, and to the extent that such populations might include stateless persons, uh, they can be disproportionately affected by this policy. So stateless persons may have difficulty acquiring proof of date documents from authorities in the country of their birth. So even though there's this incompatibility on these two issues, if you look at Canada's other international human rights obligations, uh, the legal framework is also slightly compatible with Article 9 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, which recognizes the right of everyone to social security, including social insurance, and the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights on General Recommendation 20, uh, says everyone includes uh, in, everyone includes non-nationals as well as stateless persons. In addition, under Article 5e sub Roman numeral 4 of the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, states are to guarantee the right of everyone without distinction as to national or ethnic origin to equality before the law in the enjoyment of the right to social security. And general recommendation 30 of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination says that states are under an obligation to guarantee equality between citizens and non-citizens non -citizens in the enjoyment of these rights. And so Canada is a party to both of those conventions and that could be an avenue to um, make Canada a bit more compatible. And quickly, I'll go over Article 27 and 28, which deals with identity papers and travel documents. Article 27 requires states to issue identity papers to stateless persons who are physically present in their territory, regardless of whether they are in the country lawfully. Now, identity papers under the convention uh, is really talking about domestic passports, uh, and they're not for journeys abroad but just to be used for internal purposes. And for stateless persons with an immigration status in Canada, immigration documents such as uh, permanent residence card, study and work permits, temporary residence permits, and visitor record can be considered proof of identity. Uh, however, for stateless persons in Canada without such a status, identity papers may not be provided, uh, and stateless persons may not seek identity documents from authorities for fear of exposing their unlawful status, risk detention, or attempted removal. So therefore, there's just a slight incompatibility concern with respect to stateless persons without a status from exercising the rights under Article 27. And for travel documents, uh, Article 28 
require states to issue to stateless persons who are lawfully staying in their territory travel documents for the purpose of travel outside of their territory. In this respect, uh, Passport Canada can issue such documents to permanent residents who are not citizens, not, who are not yet citizens, not refugees, and otherwise stateless or unable to 